Hey, South Hills Church, Easter is just two weeks away. According to Google Trends, in the weeks leading up to Easter, Google searches for church are the highest they'll be all year. In fact, last year, 37% of Americans said they planned to attend church on Easter Sunday. Now, why am I telling you all this? Well, for one reason or another, your family, your friends, your neighbors, and coworkers are more likely to say yes to an invitation to church on Easter Sunday than any other time out of the year. So knowing that should encourage all of us to step out and invite someone to church this year for Easter. While I was at a campus a couple weeks ago, I met someone in the patio and I asked them how long they had been coming to the church. And they told me they'd been coming for six months straight. So my natural next question was, how did you find out about our campus? And this is a story she told me. She told me she works at a department store and that someone from our church was going to that store to do some shopping. And while she was assisting that person, that person took the extra effort to invite them to church. She was so moved by the invitation that she said yes. Yes. And when she came to church and she experienced South Hills, her heart was moved and she knew that this is the place she wanted to be at every single week. And just like that, a simple invitation changed her life. So I wanna encourage all of us to take the extra effort and see who God puts in our life to extend an invitation to this Easter. Today, as you, uh, I've, I've done my best over the last few weeks to kind of describe what this series is about, and I know most of us possibly have been here uh, at least one week of this month. Maybe there's some who uh, this is your first time coming in the in the month of March, and if so, um, this series, Economic Atheist, the simple way to put it is, is that you know we live like Christians or followers of Christ in every area of our life, except one sometimes. Sometimes it seems that our economics, our finances, our money is where we're more like atheists. We don't believe that God has principles. We don't believe that God has things for us in that area. And the truth is, is that it's probably because most of the time we think, well, God just wants us to give to the church, right? God just wants us to give more. Well, that's not true. The truth is, is that God wants us to submit everything to him and his principles so that he can bless us, so that we can live a life that's under his blessing and as we'll see in just a bit, more than enough. But today, I want to tie up what we've been talking about with what I believe to be some incredible insights or perspectives, if you will. And I don't say that because I have such great knowledge or insight, but because as we're pursuing God, confirmations, and revelations are coming from every study, every conversation, and every bit of testimony that's happening around us. The more conversations I have with you, the more God shows me that we're doing the right things. Not only are we doing the right things, He keeps us on track by telling us that we need to stick to these things. We need to stick to those things. And maybe let go of this and that, but always look to Him. One of the most important things we can do in pursuing God is to pay attention. Pay attention. That's such an easy little phrase to say, but I believe it's so important to pay attention to what's going on around us. Pay attention to the good things in our lives. Pay attention to also seeing what doesn't belong. Paying attention to what God is doing. This is my objective personally in this season, and it's these three things. Stay the course. Slow down and see the gold. Some of you might interpret that as see the good, but for me, it's see the gold because God's continually refining us. He's burning out the things that we don't need so that we can stick to Him 
and have the things that we do need in our lives. But stay the course, slow down, and see the gold. That's what the Lord has impressed on me in this season. And I don't ever believe that God just shares something with me just for me. I shouldn't say that as a fact for always. I'm sure there might be times. But for the most part, because he's called me to serve you, I believe that whatever he speaks to me, whatever he shares with me, is for us. It's for us as a body, for the body as a whole, for the church in general, not just this little church on this little corner, but for the church in general. So, some of the strongest points we've found in this series are this, and I'm going to read through just a few of them. Number one, it all starts with the heart. Number two, worry never helps, it only hurts. Number three, surrender is the most important step towards success. Number four, more than enough is part of the master plan. Number five, we have to be confident in his plan and committed to his purpose. And the last one, the starting point, is laying everything at his feet. So today, I got three words that we're going to look at And those three words are money, pride, and hate. I know it sounds a little strong. It's kind of like, oh man, here we go. But I promise you, you'll be encouraged today because like I said, I believe there's some different perspectives that we're going to take on each one of those words because I believe that God has a different way of looking at it than we might have in our current times. First of all, the word money was not in the Bible, at least not how we would use it today. Some of you might remember back when we talked about the word truth and the actual Hebrew word emet, not emet, emet. But the Hebrew word emet, which is the word for truth, which doesn't mean just truth. It means the beginning, middle, and end of all truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. We know the line. The first The middle and the very last letter of the Hebrew alphabet make up this word. But the letters of the Hebrew alphabet also double as numbers when it comes to the Hebrew language. And the number one, or aleph, alpha, as we know, actually was used in Hebrew very specifically when referring to God. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. That was deliberate in the Bible. There was a purpose for that. See, when you take that letter or number, the number one, the first letter of the alphabet, away, it leaves only the word met, which in Hebrew means death. Remove God from truth, and all you have left is death. There's no life without Him, and that's the ultimate truth. Now, here's where I'm going with this. When you see the word money in biblical translations, it was actually mammon. And that's why sometimes you'll read it as you can't serve God and mammon. Some translations will say you can't serve God and money. But I believe that's a bit of a disservice. See, the Aramaic word mammon, which Jesus would have used and later found in original Hebrew writings, would best be translated that in which one trusts so when you read the word money in scripture God Jesus was actually saying that in which you trust he wasn't specifically talking about currency he wasn't specifically talking about our tangible money he was talking about what we put our trust in so when he says you can't serve God and mammon you can't serve God and trust something else You have to put your trust in Him. You know how our currency says, in God we trust? Now let that sink in a little bit more. Is it truly in who we trust? 1 Timothy 6 says, the love of money, or mammon, is the root of all kinds of evil. I know a lot of times we read that as is that the love of money is the root of all evil. But technically it says the root of all kinds of evil. Replace it with mammon or the true definition. And I'll make it easy for us to understand this morning. 
When we trust in anything other than God, it is the root of all kinds of destruction. It's as simple as that. Do you know what the root of not trusting in God is? Pride. Our word number two. It's my interpretation based on what we just went over that pride is actually the true root of all evil. If we believe that Lucifer or the devil is real and he was an angel at one point and he believed that he was as powerful or as smart as God, then what was his original sin? It was pride. The book of Proverbs has much to say about pride. It says, when pride comes, then comes disgrace. It says, pride comes before a great fall. I've always thought of that, and I've thought, man, anytime I feel like I'm, I'm getting prideful about something, I feel like I'm taking the credit for something, I think, oh, man, I don't want a great fall. I better be careful. It says, better to live humbly with the poor than to share with the proud. It says, the Lord detests the proud. That's pretty strong. Detests. And it says, I hate pride and arrogance. I hate a strong word. I know. And we're not there yet. Just hold on just a second. See, James 4 says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. I like to think of it this way. Trust is an act of surrender. Surrender, an act of humility. And humility, an act of wisdom. See, to trust, you have to surrender. And to surrender, you have to have humility. And humility shows wisdom. The opposite of pride, as we can see by the definition in the word here. Now, I know I've shared how much I love the idea of Jesus reclining at the table. But why is it so significant? You'll find in the scripture so many times that Jesus is reclining at the table with somebody he's enjoying a meal, right? And we like to think of it as he's just kicking back, right? He, maybe he's in a lazy boy. Anybody still have a lazy boy? I know they're not, you know, modern anymore. So it's like you can't have a lazy boy. You can have a nice something that's like very chic and small. I'd take a lazy boy any day, right? I mean, they're so comfy. It's my chair. I'm watching the game, all right? I mean, that's, that's, that's the best way to put it. But see... The Pharisees and religious leaders even said how they couldn't believe he would recline at the table with sinners. It was a shock to them. Because that's who he was reclining with almost every time. The sinner, the unchurched, the ones who didn't practice religion. And that in itself was an act of humility. To not only spend time with, but to be totally vulnerable you know why? Because the reason the Bible says reclining is because tables in those days weren't high like ours. They didn't have chairs. They sat on the ground. And, and they almost laid on the ground. It was almost like they sat with their legs out a little bit. They had pillows that they would lean on and they would eat with their hands. We would look at that today and go, oh, man, I don't think I'd do that. I've got to have a nice chair. I've got to be comfy. Be careful. That could be a form of pride, right? I mean, Jesus reclined at the table with the worst of them. And you didn't just invite anyone to your table. It was an honor. And Jesus saw it that way. The religious leaders saw it as a disgrace. So not only did he humble himself in just being there, but also being completely void of pride. In Proverbs where it says he hates pride. This is the verse in its entirety. Proverbs 8.13 says, To fear the Lord is to hate evil. It says, I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior and perverse speech. Some of those things we have to interpret on our own. Some of those things we got to think about. What is evil behavior? What is perverse speech? Might be a little bit different to some of us. Some of us might be in a world where there's a lot of perverse speech and we might think that small things don't matter. Maybe they don't. Maybe they do. That's something that we have to figure out in interpreting what God is sharing with us and what God tells us in His Word. But he, He's very clear about the, 
fact that he says, I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior and perverse speech. To fear the Lord is to hate evil. Now, the root of pride is fear. And when you truly fear God, you rid yourself of all pride. See, many of us would think that, I think it's pretty safe to say that nobody likes a real prideful person, right? Nobody likes an arrogant person. Nobody likes a person with a giant ego. You're usually like, ah, I try to avoid those people. I don't like the conversation. I don't really like hearing all about them all the time. But, you know, what if the truth is, is, is that that pride just comes from fear? This comes from insecurity. We might think of it a little different, right? We might think of them a little bit different because we struggle with it sometimes. When our insecurities are what guide us, when our fears are what guide us, then pride usually wells up to protect us. The fear of God is the ultimate form of trust. It says, God, you're the only thing I find substance in. You're my source, my strength, my supplier. I can't imagine living without you. That and that alone brings incredible fear. That's the fear of God. On Wednesday night in our men's Bible study, we went through the back half of Romans 12 and I want to read it this morning. Romans 12 verses 9 through 21 says this. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he or she is thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on their head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. There is so much goodness in this chapter. It's amazing to read through that and to see all those things and to think, gosh, Jesus is teaching us to be so patient and kind and long-suffering. It's pretty difficult. It feels like, man, there's a lot there. But I want to specifically look at the beginning and the end. It says, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil and cling to what is good. Let's talk about the word hate. The root word as a noun in Greek is best translated sorrow, grief, and calamity, more so a feeling. The action of, or as a verb, to hate is to passionately pursue. Now look back at those two verses, the first verse and the last verse. Verse nine says, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil and cling to what is good. And verse 21 says, do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. See, anger, malice, revenge, and even frustration don't work in this context. Our definition of hate, the way we look at hate, is not right. It's not the correct way that God says for us to passionately pursue grief, sorrow, and calamity. See, passionately pursue grief and sorrow when it comes to evil and use love to overcome it would be what God is telling us to do in this. When you think of hating evil, when you think of hating things around you that are wrong, that are bad, that are destroying the, the world around us, our children, this generation, all of the things that we may hold dear, when you think of hating those things, what does it do? Does it cause anger? Does it cause frustration? Does it cause malice? Does it cause you want to smack somebody upside the head? 
Sometimes it does, doesn't it? That's not what God's telling us to do. He's saying that we should passionately pursue grief and sorrow when it comes to these things, that it should break our hearts. He says, hate what is evil. When you think of evil in this world, it should break your heart. It should cause so much sorrow and grief that you passionately pursue a way for love to overcome it. That's the goal of the church. That's the goal of us as followers of Christ. Yes, we get angry sometimes at things around us. The Bible says be angry, but sin not. When he says to hate what is evil, he's saying make sure that you use love to overcome. Make sure that love is the weapon that you have because of all the grief and sorrow that it's causing you. When we feel sorrow or something grieves us, love is the only answer. Love truly does overcome. Now those three things that I believe that God has really impressed upon my heart, stay the course, slow down, and see the gold. Let me give you a little bit of definition for those right now. Staying the course means keeping our trust in Him, not mammon, not money, wealth, possessions, greed, self-serving security. Security is found in Him. Stay the course. Slow down means pay attention. Don't let pride creep in. Humility is a steady lifestyle, not just a momentary action. Rid yourself of all pride by fearing God. Slow down and stop if you need to and readjust who He is to you and in your life. Do you fear living without Him? Slow down and pay attention to what He's doing, what He's up to. See the gold. See the good, if you will. The evil in this world should cause our hearts to grieve. It should bring a feeling of sorrow, not anger. Allow that sorrow to challenge you, to overcome it with love. And the only way that can happen is to see that even the feeling of hating evil has gold in it. How could hate have anything good in it? How is that possible? Because God says that we're supposed to passionately pursue. Breaking our heart. Causing us to allow His love to overcome it. I want to close with a portion of Luke to bring this series to a close. Yes, this series was about our economics. Yes, this series was about our possessions and what we have and how we can do a better job of listening to God, how we can do a better job of treating His principles as our source, as our guide, as our direction in life. But I think we've found that if we truly give Him our heart in its entirety, and if we truly lay everything at His feet, if we choose to trust in Him, our finances will come right along with that. It'll be a result of. It's the same as if we give Him everything. He gives a lot back. I want to read this, Luke chapter 12, verse 13 through 21. Someone in the crowd said to Him, Teacher, Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus replied, man. I love that. It's kind of like he replied, dude. (laughs) Look at that. That's all he says there. Jesus replied, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? (laughs) Then he said to them, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. That's where we get that little statement from. Eat, drink, and be merry. Uh, But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. 
I love how it doesn't end at whoever stores up things for themselves. Because that's what most of us would read is that the Bible's telling us we can't store up things for ourselves. It's, that's not the end. He doesn't say you can't have. Remember, more than enough is part of the master plan. But we must be rich in him above all else. If that's not the foundation, then it's rooted in mammon and pride. We should be grieved by those things, by mammon, by pride, causing us to pursue love and how we can serve and give, not store up and gain. See, when we give God everything, He gives us more than enough. It's a principle of the word, of His word. When we give Him everything, He gives us more than enough. Does that mean that you need to sell all your things and give it all to Him? No. That wasn't the point of the rich young ruler. The point is he wanted to know if the rich young ruler would actually even give him his heart, would even say, you know what? Okay, Lord, if that's what you want from me, I'll do it. Kind of like Abraham and Isaac, right? When he had him on the altar, Abraham has his son Isaac on the altar. He's ready to sacrifice him. What does God do? He was never, he was never going to let him do that. Ever. He just wanted to see that Abraham would give him his heart, would give him his best. When we lay everything at his feet, he will take care of us more than we could ever imagine. At every campus today, we have a challenge that we'd like to take together, a simple step of action, if you will. And I know that many of us, when we talk about all these things, we think of how, so how do I do this? How do I lay everything at his feet? How do I passionately pursue grief and sorrow when it comes to the evil in the world around me, when it comes to my children and me wanting to protect them? That's where trusting in God comes into play. If you need to write a list like we talked about a few weeks ago, take inventory of the things that matter to you most and find out where God is on that list. If there's a time where you need to journal and write down the things that you're thinking about in that day, and find out where God is in your thoughts. Maybe it's those simple things. Maybe it's taking something and saying, God, I don't need this anymore in my life. Well, today, at every campus, every South Hills campus, we have this action step for us to take as a church. And it's this, identify one area of your life you could spend less on in order to grow your ability to give. So much of this series has been about the heart. All of it's about the heart. If you haven't figured that out about Jesus, about God yet, then I bet you're having a hard time serving him because it feels like it's always about the actions. It's always about what we do. But truly, it's about who we are. And if we find that he's our source and we find that he's everything to us, that our fear of him is more than any fear that we could possibly have in this world. That's where the heart comes into play. Because once he has our heart, then he's ready to shower us with every bit that he has for each and every one of us. And it might be different for you than it is for me. Some of us, when we, when we give our gifts over and our talents and our time, it causes a monetary result. Some of you have been very, very successful. And you say, I've worked hard for that success. And that is very true. But where did those gifts come from? Did God create you a likable person? Did God create you with discipline and determination, creativity? God created us all with different gifts. When we use them in the right way and when we surrender them to Him, we will find success. Surrender is the most important step towards success. Would you bow your heads with me? (laughs) Lord, I thank you, God, for even the distractions in this world, God, that cause us to know that despite those things, we're still focused on you. Despite those things, you're still focused on us. And sometimes it's in the distractions and in the trials and in the things that we go through that you're trying to speak to us that you're trying to get our attention and we so easily look to the side. 
the left, the right, behind us, everywhere but forward. God, my prayer this morning is that we would keep our eyes fixed on you. My prayer is, is that no matter what's happening around us, and no matter what we've done in the past, that as the book of Romans says, now we know that there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. That Lord, we take today and we move forward in you. We say, Lord, I will fix my eyes on you. And all things, all things will work together. I have to believe that, Lord, because your word says it. So I trust in you and I do my best to follow your principles and to make them a part of my life. If there's anybody in here this morning that says, I, you know, I, I sure would love to make these principles a part of my life, but I don't know that I would call myself a Christian. I don't know that I would call myself a follower of Christ. And I'm sure some of us are struggling with our relationship with God. Some of us are trying to figure it out. But for those of you in here that say, I don't think I, I, don't think I ever could have called myself a Christian. And if you're here and you say, I want to accept Jesus as the Lord of my life. I want to trust him with everything in my life. I want to lay everything at his feet and believe that he has my best interest at hand. If that's you this morning and you want to make the decision to follow Christ with every head bowed and every eye closed, would you just look up and make eye contact with me so that I can be praying with you and for you? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like us all to do something together with our heads bowed. I'd like everybody to just repeat this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, I invite you into my life like never before. Be my Lord. Be my guide. Be my source. I don't want to live for anything else but you. I say these things in your name. In Jesus' name. Amen. There's a lot of goodness happening around us if we pay attention. Most of our conversations are spent talking about the things that we need to fix and the things that are wrong and the things that we wish were different. But if we stay focused on the good, if we stay focused on what God is doing, we'll be stronger, we'll be more patient, we'll be more kind, we'll find more joy and more peace in our lives. There's a lot of good happening. I challenge you to pay attention. Would you stand with me? Just a couple things before we go. Number one, we got men's breakfast this Saturday. So from here on out, we're changing it to the first Saturday of every month. I get probably three or four guys every month ask me, is it this Saturday or next Saturday? And I'm like, you know, it's probably better we just switch to the first. And we weren't going to do men's breakfast on the Saturday right before Easter. That probably would have been difficult. So from here on out, we will do men's breakfast on the first Saturday of every month. And we have a very special guest coming to share with us this Saturday. His name's Michael. And uh, he's the director of a whole bunch of the Young Life stuff here in the area, which means he's going to our high schools and our schools and speaking to young people. And there's a lot of salvations happening and there's a lot of good things happening. He gets to share it with us this Saturday. Also, after that, we are going to have a work day. If anybody wants to stick around and help us finish up some things, we'll send out an email about that as well. Um, family night this week is going to be tacos with the team. So if you're kind of new here and you're like, man, I'd love to get a chance to chat with you and hear a little bit more about what's going on or the church, uh, we're going to do a little Q&A and then we're also going to just hang out and have dinner together. We're going to have a special activity for the kids outside uh, so that they're not crazy all over us because they are, um, but we love them for it. Um, and also uh, next week, Sunday, we're having baptisms. 
And yes, we're having baptisms. It's Palm Sunday. It's a fantastic day to get baptized. If you or anybody else in your family has not been baptized, or maybe you're at a place where you're like, you know what, it was so long ago, or maybe you were baptized as an infant. I was baptized as as an infant, and then I got baptized later in life when I thought, you know what, I want to make this a public confession. Uh, We're going to do baptisms. We have a really nice baptismal that's going to be right here with hot water in it, okay? So it's going to be fantastic, (laughs) yeah. So if... uh, if you would like to be baptized, we are going to send out an email as well, but um, you can go to the QR code, and I believe that there's a sign-up there. Um, if for some reason you can't find a way to sign up through that or you, you can't figure it out, uh, please send us an email and let us know, and we'll make sure you get what you need. We still need some Easter candy, uh, so throughout the week or even by next Sunday, if you can bring in some Easter candy, we want to have at least a couple 3,000 eggs uh, for the kids. Yeah, a couple three. So two to 3,000 eggs, if that didn't catch for any of it. But... Um, Yeah, and we're going to have Easter egg hunts. We're going to have a doggy Easter egg hunt. Uh, You didn't know this, but we're going to have baby chicks. Come on. Who doesn't want to hold a baby chick? Okay, so we're going to have that. Rock painting, uh, egg dyeing, our cake and everything for our second birthday because Easter is birthday number two for us as a church. So... uh, We sent out a mailer, um, I don't know, 2,500 homes, and we're doing a big social media blast next week, so it might be pretty packed. I don't know yet, but we may end up having to do an 8.30 service on that day, so be praying for us. Just be praying for us, okay? Uh, We do have a couple new groups that haven't started yet. Uh, We're a little behind, but actually with the Easter season coming up, we figured it would be best to wait until after Easter to really start groups, so I think I mentioned last week, I think the Ambroses are talking about having a group. I know that Dee, who comes to the first service, she's going to have a group at a cafe that has to do with kind of healthy living and stuff. And I've actually had a couple more conversations about people who are willing to open up their homes. So uh, groups are coming. If you are patiently awaiting a group, thank you for your patience. It's coming. We're going to have a blast. That's about it. Um, I know that many of you give and are generous in many, many ways. Uh, if you want to give today, we've got a box on this table and a couple boxes on the way out. And you can always give on the Church Center app. But thank you for your generosity. Thank you for uh, just listening to the Lord and seeing what He has for your life. So let me pray over what's given, what's received, and as you go. Lord, I thank you so much for each and every family represented, every household represented, every single person here, God. I pray that you would bless our homes, our jobs, our finances, our lack of jobs, our lack of finances, Lord. Bless our hearts as we give them over to you, God. As we lay everything at your feet, Lord, we believe that you have our best at hand, God. Continue to bless us all, Lord. But most of all, we pray that you're blessed by all we do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.